uh, over the past couple of weeks, Lucio has been presenting chapter four to us about classification when it comes to machine learning. And today I'd like to walk us through some of the exercises from the end of that chapter four. I thought what would be useful though is to just quickly review some of our learning objectives to kind of keep a broad sense of some of our activity here. We are going to compare and contrast classification with linear regression. We have looked at and now we're going to perform the log log logistic regression. Similarly for linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, and maybe at least think about some of naive bays. In the exercises, we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of various classification models. And um, previously, postponed regression was mentioned, but I don't think we'll see that in the exercises. Before I forget, the exercises and the solutions were formed and placed on this GitHub repository, which I believe belongs to one of the former cohort members or a member of a previous cohort. What I did was transfer them over to the Bookdown site and added a few more lines of mathematics and a few more words to affect the flow of it. And as always, if folks have questions, feel free to use the Zoom chat or just unmute yourself. The first question was um, double checking if the equations really did connect with each other. Here we're asking if the logistic function representation for logistic regression, which we recognize here, is we equivalent to the logit function representation. Quickly going through and arranging both sides, here I offer the proof. For the sake of time and civility, I don't think we need to read every line of the proof, or at least not hear me say that out loud, so we'll move on. Thinking about the Gaussian distribution and how it's used, under the assumption that the case class is drawn from the Gaussian distribution, this um, kernel for producing the probabilities is largest when x is equal to mu k. Because if you think of Gaussians, they're the bell-shaped curves, maybe in multiple dimensions but the mode would happen right in the middle when your observation happens to be at the mean. And I was thinking that the observations, um, these values would still be large when the observations is close to the mean. The chapter four also presented that we could look at a discriminant function uh, rather than all this if, if need be. And what I offered is mostly a proof, maybe a little bit of hand-waving to get from the probability model down to the discriminant function. The idea is that if X is still close to mu K for some K class, then this discriminant function will have relatively large values uh, compared to other classes out there. For the sake of timing, I should mention that we look at about 12 problems today. <laughs> 
Next in problem three, for, for the quadratic discriminant analysis, whose observations come from a Gaussian distribution, we're going to consider the case with one feature, that is when p equals one. And we're going to show that the Bayes classifier is also quadratic, namely it's not linear. Compared to the previous proof, the previous proof assumed that the variance and standard deviation were the same across all K classes. However, if we do need to relax that assumption and not assume that the variance is the same for all K classes, this becomes different for each class. Carefully redoing the proof from above, we note that there is now a quadratic term in the discriminant function, and thus the classification process is quadratic in, in this situation, where again, we relax the assumption about the variance. Problem number four uh, in the textbook was had a lot of words, but here in the book clubs, we try to present the information as if we we're reading a slideshow to be a, a little more concise in, in at least the visual words. The overall idea about problem number four is to remind us that when the number of features is large or number of variables is large, we may encounter the curse of dimensionality. So for example, we have one feature who's coming from the uniform distribution 0, 1. And we are classifying observations within 10% of the test observation. The uniform distribution being constant as it is, we would simply use 10% of the available observations. If you kind of double check the math and the assumptions, as we go into two dimensions, well, 10% and then 10% of that, we would use only 1% of the observations. And this already starts to cut down on some of our sample size considerations. If we continue that pattern, say go into 100 features, we could develop a formula that talks about what percentage of observations we would be using that are reasonably close to what we're trying to study. So with that said, if we wanted to use a non-parametric procedure such as k-nearest neighbors, but being mindful that there might be very few observations around our where we're examining. One idea is to extend the length of the hypercube in this p-dimensional space that you would have to expand your search to find more observations. So in other words, when p is large, we have this cursive dimensionality, it makes it hard to find or encounter our, our data. And we would have to consider expanding the, the search range to, to counter that cursor dimensionality. In problem number five, asked us to review the ideas behind linear discriminant analysis and quadratic discriminant analysis. So if the ideas are how we feel about the situation with the Bayes decision boundary is linear, sure, QDA may be better on the training set with its flexibility, but we have the 
by its, by its various trade-offs. So then we have to consider how QDA would probably be worse on the test set due to higher variance. Thus, as the namesakes imply, if our decision boundary appears to be linear, linear discriminant analysis is the advised route. Otherwise, from there, if the Bayes decision boundary is nonlinear, as you can imagine, LDA is not as recommended, and thus we have the more uh, flexible system of QDA, the quadratic discriminant analysis. As elsewhere in the textbook, these first five questions or so are in the conceptual modality as far as how we're asked to look at the materials. Number six is a, a more straightforward calculation, which personally I'm thinking of introducing to my own students. Suppose that we have logistic regression, namely the equations you now see on the screen. The response variable will be the probability that a student will receive a top grade and A in the course. We're going to look at two variables, the number of hours studied and their undergraduate grade point average GPA at that point going into the course. So suppose that we have already fit the logistic regression and we got the coefficients, the constant, the coefficient on hours studied and the coefficient on GPA. With that, we could address tasks such as estimate the probability that a student who studies for 40 hours and has an undergraduate GPA of 3.5 gets an A. We plug in the 40 where X1 was. We plug in the 3.5 where X2 was and the coefficients as mentioned in the fit. So a 3.5 student who studies 40 hours we're anticipating about a 38% chance for the student to receive an A under this model. Maybe 38% doesn't sound all that optimistic. So in part B, we're gonna keep the 3.5 GPA, but then kind of see if we could get a 50% chance in the response. It turns out in this calculation, it might be more useful to use the, log the logic model. Sorry, I forget how to pronounce that. We're plugging in the 50%. We're plugging in everything else except the number of hours study, which is what we're trying to solve for here. And we find that instead of, instead of 40 hours, the model implies that the student should be studying for 50 hours. Which would probably be the middle of the logistic regression curve too, because that's at the 50% mark. Let's see, how are we doing in the audience? Uh, did you have any questions so far? Uh, well, everything clear so far for me at least. Thank you. I have a question for one of the panel. Question five. It says in general, sample size. Oh, do, do you have that question? Uh, let me see if I could find a textbook. So this is the question five. This is the one where 
de Sipoña. Ya. Yeah. Ya, the sample size increases. Do we expect the test pressure occurrence a QDA related to the improve the clean? Or I, th I think it's just, I want to confirm, I say that it doesn't change. Uh, is there any intuition behind that? Yeah, it's like, uh, the, the, the occurrence of the model in the test set depends what's the change of the data. For example, it doesn't, it doesn't meet the assumption, for example, have a common variance. The QDA will, will have a better uh, test rate than the RDA. So it's really more to the data than the number of samples. Okay. Thank you, Angel. Clear. Are you agree with me? You agree yes, with I me? agree with you. Yeah, great. You want to uh, share that point. And the other question is false, in my opinion, also the true or false. So even if the de base decision boundary for a given problem is linear, will part achieve a superior test error rate for QDA? And I agree with you that that's just most it's likely false. be false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's continue. Okay. In the calculation for problem seven, this time around, our response variable is asking whether or not a stock will issue a dividend. So binary response, yes or no. And the explanatory variable is X, last year's profit. We have a couple of different situations viewed in the past. If last year the stock profited by 10%, then the probability to issuing a dividend follows this normal distribution. But if last year's profit was zero, then the probability of issuing a dividend will be this normal distribution here. The prior probability is that there was an 80% chance that a dividend will be issued. The underlying calculation here is Bayes' rule. It's just that each probability is coming from a Gaussian. So we are, in my opinion, kind of careful about that. We have we have our prior probability times the likelihood, and then normalized by the total probability in the denominator. From there, a more straightforward calculation of Bayes rule, and this model is predicting that. At a 4% profit, there is a 75% chance that the stock will issue a dividend. Problem number eight asked us to consider a, a kind of a two-stage process. First, logistic regression was performed where there was a 30% training error and a 20% test error. Then K nearest neighbors was K equals one, so the one nearest neighbor, averaged an 18% error over training and testing set. Some commentary, again, provided by folks in previous cohorts. The one nearest neighbor model would fit the training set exactly. So the training error would be zero. The issue is that if the 18% was an average of the training and testing sets and training error is zero, that must mean that the test error was 36%. 
so that the average would be 18. Thus, if the test error was 36% with k nearest neighbors, but only 20% for logistic regression in this scenario, we would choose the logistic regression to classify new observations. In task number nine, this is a, a fairly straightforward mathematical exercise. So again, the textbook author tends to ask about more highly conceptual questions first, and then more calculating questions later. 9a, if we have a 37% probability of defaulting on a credit card, then the probability of default, I think I might have misspoke there. But the, the underlying calculation should be fine. The probability of default is 27%. Yes, yeah, I had the same, the same number. Yeah. And then um, in the reverse direction, if an individual has a 16% chance of defaulting, plugging in the 16 on that side of the equation, then there are odds would be about 19% of for defaulting. Yeah, right. Okay, so we'll look at two more problems, two examples of applied, applying these ideas with R code. Admittedly, I, before I, get to it, I did run out of time. So I'm, we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at the usage of some logistic regression, some LDA, some QDA, but I did not look up the, did not look up the code for naive Bayes. So the weekly data set as provided uh, looks at stock trends from week to week. We also have lag variables, so one week back, two weeks back, et cetera, just in case we want to double check for auto correlation. Here, we could use our usual R functions to get some sample statistics. With a manageable amount of variables, perhaps the pairs function could be useful to double check some scatter plots. So for example, you might see some more curved plots between the volume and the year, but some more usual scatter plots elsewhere. And then I went ahead and, as advised, found a correlation matrix, but for the sake of making sure everything fits on one page, one slide, I rounded everything to two decimal places. We find that between the volume and the lag variables, we have virtually zero correlation, but the volume correlates fairly highly, or actually strongly highly, with the year. So in some sense, the stock price was in probably increasing over time. For the generalized linear model as uh, was presented over, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, we use a generalized, for logistic regression, we'll use a binomial family. trying to predict if the stock is going to increase or decrease based on those lag variables and its current volume. 
we find uh, beyond the intercept coefficient itself, lag two is implied to be significant in this point of view. So looking at a stock maybe two weeks back might be a useful uh, case for further investigation. Comparing whether or not the stock went down or up versus if the model predicts whether the stock went down or up, we have this confusion matrix. And for folks that have not worked with confusion matrices all that much before, went ahead and typed in the arithmetic to give us the, a metric to judge these things. I'm gonna look at accuracy here in problem 13. The way accuracy is computed is we look at the number of correct predictions on the main diagonal, put that here, and then divide that by how many predictions were made overall. So far, our logistic model is predicting whether or not the stock will go up or down and predicting that correctly about 56% of the time. So arguably not that much better than flipping a coin arbitrarily. From there, the textbook recommended restricting our training set to more recent observations, or sorry, for observations further in the past from 1990 to 2008. So that's for the training set. And then the test set would be the more recent observations at that time from 2009, 2010. If we try a logistic model with this split, run through the production, make a confusion matrix, we do find that by carefully defining what our training and testing set are, the accuracy increased to about 63%. For linear discriminant analysis, one way to do that is to go through the mass package, get the LDA command. We're going to similarly use the training and testing set as prescribed earlier. Looking at that lag two variable in particular, because that was seen as significant in earlier exploratory data analysis, we come up with virtually the same confusion matrix, which again, an accuracy of about 63%. We'll go ahead and then practice using QDA, changing the command for making a model, once again, using the two-week leg. Now, in the QDA, it predicted that that stock would always increase. So we might be a victim of the variant side of things, where, like we were discussing earlier, if it turns out the underlying situation is linear, then QDA might not be more helpful. So that's what we have here. And in fact, the accuracy would go down if I bothered to compute it that way. Nevertheless, a model that only predicts the, the one response um, type is probably a bad model. 
trying out K nearest neighbors, there's a little bit of pre-processing that has to be done. And then we could run that with the R code. When that was all said and done, the accuracy was about 60%. The issue is that some of our earlier work with the logistic regression had already achieved an accuracy of 63%. So this accuracy is lower. And also, I didn't get to it here, but you would probably want to also use other metrics such as F-score, true positive rates, or something else. Because sometimes accuracy can be... Um, affected by sheer numbers of true negatives. Let's see, how are we doing, folks? Um, are there any questions about this exposition of problem 13? All good so far. So let's look at one more example here. In problem 14, we're going to develop a model whether a given car gets high or low gas mileage on the auto data set. Now, in the ubiquitous a cars data set that many R programmers learn early on, the miles per gallon variable itself is numeric. If we want to practice getting a categorical response variable, we need to make, make a categorical some way or another. And here, we, for one example, we could use a for loop to say that if the mileage is a, if the mileage is above the median, then we say high gas mileage, otherwise low gas mileage. And of course, there may be other ways to code this up. With that said, uh, still following the code that was provided by a previous cohort member. We're going to look at, we could look at some of the variables to see how the scatter plots appear. Variables such as cylinders are discrete in nature. That's why the dots have those columns. The miles per gallon here on the far left and the top have kind of a curved shape, maybe not maybe not implying a linear situation. And then on the far right or along the bottom row, our new uh, categorical variable for miles per gallon, that is high versus low, because there's only those two possible outcomes. We have the, the two columns of dots in our scatter plots. And that might imply a situation where logistic regression would be advised. Once again, uh, found a correlation matrix, rounded it to two decimal places to make it a little easier to see. Our response variable is going to be this miles per gallon which of course should have high correlation with the underlying numeric variable. And it has strong correlation with some of these other variables offered in the data set, it, some of them being negatively correlated. So in other words, if the number of cylinders in the cars increases, we expect the miles per gallon to decrease. And similarly for displacement, horsepower, and weight. Let's 
I took the liberty of splitting the training and testing set using a very crude tidyverse way of doing that. Fitting the linear discriminant analysis model, the categorical miles per gallon versus the four variables that we had that we saw had a, a relatively high correlation. Running that on the training set. The linear discriminant analysis. Whoops, I, I miscalculated this. This should be a, this should say 75 plus 88 up here. So if I'm just doing this math off the top of my head, I should actually get to complement an accuracy of about 87%. Okay, similarly, trying out the quadratic discriminant analysis, QDA, on our model situation. We should get a, oh, I'm sorry. Now I remember what I was doing. I was looking at the test error. So looking at the off diagonals, where we want a low amount of error, of course. Here, the... LDA is getting an error of about 13%. Using QDA decreases the error in the testing set down to about 10%. With Logistic regression, because we do have the binary response, could try that out. And we'll end up with a test error of about 12%. So that is to say, in this car example, trying to predict whether a car has has higher low gas mileage. We looked at the underlying data, looked at the correlations, built the models where the correlations were relatively large, looked at LDA, QDA, and logistic regression and found that the test error was the lowest in the QDA model for this example. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, thanks. I followed the steps on the GitHub repo, and I don't I don't know why the pull request or the push did not go through. So I hope to learn that in the future. Lucio, is there anything else for us we need to know? So um, schedule-wise, as you probably saw, these book clubs are going to take a two-week break, so we don't have, do not have to worry about daylight savings times matters. And we'll come back after two weeks, and this will now be March 26th or that weekend, with Chapter 5 on the resampling methods. If anybody wants to volunteer to cover that, feel free to sign up for it.
otherwise, uh, thank you for listening to my presentation and have a nice weekend. Bye. All right, thanks.